talking about an Internet of Cities, um, and throughout We Share, we've been talking a lot about how, how, what is the changing nature of our political structures as the world becomes both more global and has many local issues among all of that. And a big part of that is the utility of borders going forward. So I want to share um, just briefly sort of my own personal uh, sort of experience with borders and with nation states. Uh, I was born... Um, if you can see it, I was born on an island off the west coast of Canada in Victoria, so I'm Canadian by birth. Uh, I lived there for the first 16 years of my life. Uh, today, I work for the Institute for the Future, which is based out of California in the U.S., but I actually live physically in Austin, Texas, in the middle of the country. Um, part of that is because my wife uh, is from Mexico, and so we kind of immigrated together. As a result of this, because I left Canada when I was fairly young, I've never been eligible to vote in any state election in, in any country. I've, I've never been able, allowed to vote anywhere. Uh, but my children have three passports, right? So I think this is an experience that a lot of us are starting to have, which is that the borders that we live in, that we navigate, whether uh, you're sort of a privileged white dude like me, or whether you're a refugee um, trying to find a place to live, uh, that borders are increasingly a hindrance, or at least a sort of completely misaligned with the way that we're actually living our lives in terms of how we coordinate, how we work, how we learn, um, and, and how we go about our lives. Um, and so I want to start with sort of the problem, you know, and this is, this is something that was articulated a lot on the first day of we Share, but I think it's worth making the argument, and I want to start to talk about some of the mechanisms we actually have to build an Internet of City, because I do believe that they're there. So the, the essential problem I'm going to start with is that the world has become too interconnected for our current generation of governments. Um, and by this I mean that when you look at the issues that are staring at us over the next decade that are going to be even more disruptive than they already are, with record numbers of 65 million refugees, uh, with uh, massive youth unemployment across the world, when you look at issues like climate change or the refugee crisis, uh, or at automation, which is just starting now and is going to become significantly more of a, a factor, uh, all of these are issues where it makes the most sense to think of them both in the global context, right? These are all inherently global issues. Uh, in terms of you know global climate change, global automation, and in the very hyper-local context, right, in the actual sort of jobs and services and experiences that people have in the communities where they live, uh, and so the nation state, our, you know, which we've been living with for last few hundred years or so, uh, is actually really awkwardly positioned to deal with these issues because it's neither truly global nor is it truly local, right? It sort of awkwardly sits between these two uh, and is very poorly suited to dealing with the problems that we're having. Um, and this is both obvious and is now also playing itself out, right? Um, we've seen that trust in governments, has, in national governments in particular, has dropped precipitously over the last few decades. So people don't trust their national governments anymore, by and large. And uh, this is particularly true in, in the West, uh, looking at places like the U.S. Um, about 30 years ago, 40 years ago, three quarters of Americans said that they trusted their their government, basically, and now only one in five do. And this stat is from even before the most recent election, right? So this was when we had Obama, not even um, the, the current administration. And, and you know, it's obviously this, this lack of trust in national governments is playing itself out in terms of populist uprisings, right? We see the most polarized elections we've seen in over a generation in countries like America. France just had its near miss. We have Brexit. Uh, we just have the civil strife, and I think it makes a lot of sense to to view this sudden polarization and strife that we're seeing uh, across so much of the world from the perspective of just how poorly suited our national governments are in any capacity to deal with the issues that we have. Um, so yes, we've seen this in America, we've seen it in Britain, and it's really all over the world. This is a, a graph we put together as a part of the program that I run from the Edelman Trust Index, which has for uh, several decades been... Uh, gauging public trust in different kinds of institutions. And you can see the red there. That's where there's like very little trust in national governments. So uh, there's not data from lots of different countries throughout Africa, but from the countries we do have data in, um, most of the world has seen this precipitous drop in trust in national governments. There, a couple of the, the exceptions are countries like China and India that have invested very recently in modernizing their grid. Um, trust there is a little bit higher. Um, 
So, so what do we do, right? So if our national governments are not just sort of have inadequate policies, but are actually kind of obsolete in terms of their capability to deal with things like climate change and automation uh, and, and refugee flows, then what is our solution? And I think one of the, the reason why I wanted to come here today is because I think that the seeds of the problem are also the seeds of the solution. And I believe that very strongly. Uh, part of the solution is to actually recognize that we are living our lives very differently than we've ever lived them before. And it's because of the phone, right? The iPhone is 10 years old this year, as of like this month. Um, and you can even just, you know, this is something we still talk about as kind of a fringe thing because it's so new, but it's really changing the fabric of how our society works. And uh, so, you know, recent sort of polls have across the UK have shown that the average citizen of the UK uh, spends about 20 hours online a week. That number goes up to 27 hours online a week for people under 30. Uh, in China, if regardless of age, people are spending 27 hours online a week. With young people, many reports spending 17 hours a day uh, online, live streaming, playing games. And a lot of this, you know, it's, it's, we're inclined to think of a lot of this as being sort of frivolous. There's a lot of like Instagram liking and like Snapchat filters going on in there. But it's also just how we live our lives increasingly. Um, and it's through these platforms that are really built on top of the phone, right? So. Um, the disruption that we've seen in terms of how we coordinate many of our commercial activities is dramatic. And it, again, it's worth just looking at the recent statistics of how quickly the way we do things has changed. So it only took Uber five years from not existing to having more rides booked every day, more cars on the road in New York City than yellow cabs, right? This sort of iconic taxi-filled city. It took five years for them to completely upend the taxi industry pretty much everywhere in the world. That's like unheard of, right? They're, they're actually now, uh, uh, according to Forbes, they're the third largest private employer in the world. So more people in the private sector work for Uber than just about any other company, with the exception of a couple. Um, Airbnb took four years to, with no assets, no hotel infrastructure, to have more rooms booked overnight uh, around the world than the entire Hilton hotel chain, which has spent billions of dollars perfecting their play in this industry and perfecting their market. An app on a phone replaced, not replaced, but uh, provided a service that people want more uh, in four years. Um, and so, all of these platforms are more alike than they are different. And this is a really fundamental part of, of what I want to talk about because it's, it's tempting to think of like, oh, there's Uber and there's Airbnb and here's some platforms. And, but really what's happening is at a very fundamental level, people, individuals, are able to opt into global services through, these device, through their devices, right? So this is the, the first big thing is that services um, like Uber and Airbnb are not being provided in a local context, they're being provided in a global context. And yet, all of these services are incredibly well suited towards hyper-local customization. So if you're using Facebook or Netflix or Uber or Amazon or any of these sort of global platform services, uh, really significantly, every single user of those services has a, a different experience of them, right? So you get both global coordination at the platform level and you get hyper-local customization. And this is table stakes for any kind of platform. And that's really important because that is specifically the thing that the nation states are not providing, is both global coordination and local context. Um, and this is a global story, right? I think that it's, it's actually fairly easy to overstate the digital divide. And I know that there are many people, there's over you know, 2 billion people that do not have access to any kind of internet or mobile devices. But in the next 10 years, it's projected that 5.7 billion people will have access, right? We're already at about 4.5 billion people. So the phone in the near term, in terms of the actual solutions that we want to arrive at, is, is worth thinking about as a ubiquitous asset, right? That we've done a lot of research at the Institute for the Future about the, the proliferation of phones in places like Nigeria, where uh, the phone is not just sort of a technology luxury item, it is like the center of people's uh, lives in terms of electricity, right? People are investing in the battery. They sell these uh, Ghanaian power bank phones um, where uh, it's got a massive 10,000 milliamp battery in it and it's got a USB right in the back and they will sell this phone for about $40 and it comes with a whole network of peripherals. So you, you can plug like a soldering iron into your phone, right? So the phone really becomes the sort of centerpiece of a digital life um, and the majority of young 
young people today are going to have access to this around the world. So this is, this is a viable solution and, and we're thinking about rather than just being sort of a, you know, a bobble in the West. Um, uh, a, a big point of that, so Mike Zuckerman, uh, my colleague from the Institute, spoke on the first day about his work with refugees. Report after report tells us that this 65 million refugees, um, that they all have phones, that phones have become as essential of a resource as food and water, because as people are separated from their homes, from their families, from their communities, that the portable infrastructures made possible by their phones um, are the only infrastructures that they can rely on as they move from country to country, from camp to camp. Uh, so this is how people are staying in touch with their friends and their family. This is how they're coordinating their lives in the absence of any kind of national infrastructure that they can rely on. And they're in some ways kind of leading edge users for the world that I'm describing, right? That if you cannot rely on where you're going to be over the course of your education, it's really difficult to imagine being in any one given nation's education system because the certification, the courses, the curriculums, all of those things, you're going to lose all of your progress as you move from place to place. So on platforms like WhatsApp, these kinds of learning apps with very sort of practical micro skills have blossomed because if you need to learn German, if you need to learn a specific skill, you're always going to have WhatsApp. You're not always going to have whatever institution you would traditionally rely on to do that. So the, the benefits of these in terms of adapting to volatile circumstances, which now refugees are in volatile circumstances, we're all going to be in volatile circumstances as climate change worsens and as automation uh, hits more uh, industries. These kinds of services are much more inherently resilient. Now, the problem that we have with relying on platforms, and I, I didn't, wasn't able to attend the session. Uh, apparently, there was a representative from Uber talking to a mayor uh, in the, the circus just before this. Is, is a representative from Uber here? I would love for him to be here. No? Okay. So the problem with these platforms is that they've, they've been riding this very sort of multinational corporate infrastructure, and that in itself is not a problem because corporations are perhaps uniquely good at creating consistent, reliable infrastructure with good user experiences. So I think there, there's mechanisms uh, that corporations provide that are essential piece of what we're doing. But the problem is that as these platforms become really important to how we're living our lives, things like Airbnb, it's not just a really convenient way to stay somewhere. And it's not just disruptive to hotel chains, which we'd all kind of be fine with, right? That's the normal flow of the market. But it's also disruptive to low-income housing, right? So people that would traditionally be renting out apartments as low-income housing in the US, many of those people are using Airbnb instead. It's very difficult to regulate an app on people's phones. And it's very difficult to think of people who are using Airbnb as like hotel owners who should be taxed at a corporate rate. So it breaks a lot of our models for how we think about social contracts. They break a lot of our models for how we think about regulatory frameworks. So in general, they're, they're just disruptive to kind of every institution that we have. And they've become too important, too sort of foundational to our social contract for companies to be structured to deal with them adequately, right? So I think the critique of corporate ownership of platforms does not come for me from sort of an overriding sort of critique of, of corporations as organizations, but more that the hard-won social contracts that people have fought with governments over hundreds of years is not a part of the equation of companies. And it needs to be if these services are going to be sustainable over the longer term. So... The benefit, though, the thing that nobody, I think, quite realizes yet, which has come out of a lot of research, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in here realize it, this is a very smart audience, but in addition to being incredibly powerful, these platforms are also essentially commodities. They, if you own no assets, it's incredibly easy to get people around the world to buy it. It's incredibly easy to get knocked out. Uh, as well, because there's no lock-in, right? I mean, something like Facebook or Uber, the reason that they succeed and continue to succeed is almost entirely because of the network effect, right? That if you're an Uber driver or an Uber passenger, you know that everybody around you, every passenger and driver is also using that platform. That's where the action is. But um, I'm from Austin, Texan, Texas, as I mentioned, and living in Austin, uh, in Austin as um, over the last couple of years, uh, there's been a really interesting signal that's been happening at the city level in Austin that I think is sort of a key to what happens next, uh, which is that the part of the solution, so part of it is, is platforms recognizing how essential they've become to how we coordinate ourselves. The second is to think about the city differently than we've been thinking about it. Uh, recently, a couple years ago, Austin, Texas actually ended up kind of kicking out Uber and Lyft because they wanted more control over how drivers were hired. And Uber and Lyft felt like Austin's not a big enough market to negotiate with, like a New York or a San Francisco or a Paris. 
So they said, well, you need us more than we need you. We'll leave. You'll be begging for us back. And what happened was that within a couple months, dozens of Uber alternatives flooded the market. Dozens of, of ones that were created that were white label, dozens of ones that were just created from scratch. Uh, they, and at the city level, that network effect was able to be created. So. Um, uh, uh, one called Fasten uh, became the, sort of one of the dominant ones. That's the one that I primarily use. There's a co-op-based uh, ride share that's incredibly popular in Austin called Ride Austin, where all of the profit is shared among the drivers and it has features that Uber doesn't have. And the experiences of these platforms are not significantly worse than Uber. This is why Uber is pursuing moonshots like self-driving cars and flying cars, because they know that what they have is a commodity service and a brand. Um, and so Uber and Lyft recently kind of begged to come back to the city, but now they're the upstarts, right? Now they have to compete with Fasten and, and with uh, Ride Austin. So these are essentially commodities. And the network effect that allows them to capture the market is, is an effect that cities are actually well suited to create. So the, the idea of a city state is, is obviously not new. This is something that I'm sure has come up in a lot of panels this week and came up at the beginning of the event. But we have relied on cities as sort of the, the, the catalysts of historic transition throughout a lot of history, right? Baghdad catalyzed the, the, the golden era of the Middle East. Um, individual cities were sort of the, the catalysts of, of the Renaissance. Uh, even now, it's largely cities like London's and the Sao Paulo's that are the global economic engines of the countries that they reside in. And there's three major factors that cities have, three major characteristics that makes them well suited to the future we're headed towards. The first is the size, that they are inherently right-sized for legitimate governance, right? That you can, they are self-contained systems, self-contained populations, that they're a coherent system where you can actually create platforms that, that affect enough people but aren't trying to be at the scale of the world and aren't necessarily even trying to be at the scale of the country. Um, and really significantly, real work can get done in cities today that cannot any longer get done at the national level. Uh, I brought up this map earlier. The most important thing about this map is just how specifically polarized the last election in America was. Uh, there's been, you know, everybody in the world every day in every moment has been talking about Trump and trying to figure out what happened, right? Why did Trump happen? Why did Brexit happen? There's all theories. There's, there's racism. There's uh, sort of ethnic hostility and there's uh, fears of automation. If you want to know what characteristic made people the most likely to vote for Trump uh, in the American election, it's not necessarily whether they were a part of the Republican Party or not. It's whether they lived in a city or a rural area. Uh, if you lived in a city, you voted Democrat more than any election in modern American history. If you lived in a rural area, if the population was just a little bit less dense, at a certain threshold, you were significantly more likely to vote for Trump. So really significantly, this is a, an urban-rural story that we're experiencing. And people in cities agree on a lot. So people within San Francisco and New York and Paris and London and Hong Kong, the residents of those cities agree together on a lot more than they even do with their own countrymen in many cases, right? So we're seeing sort of national culture sort of subsumed largely into city culture organically already. As we've seen with, uh, you know, as Mark Watts said on day one, that mayors are, are stepping up as sort of the champions of climate change because countries have not been able to make any movement. So if individual cities can band together and say, we're going to enforce these regulations on climate change and we're going to have our economic activity filtered through that, that has a lot more legitimacy locally and a lot more power collectively than the kind of mismatched different nations uh, that are meeting uh, today uh, elsewhere in the world. So that's number two, is that real work can get done. And number three is that people actually trust their local governments still. So this is another thing that came out of our research was that as national, as trust in national governments has plummeted, trust in local governments is, is, is quite high in a lot of the West, and particularly uh, looking at data in America, whereas people don't trust that all the federal government and they don't trust the state government, they do trust their city governments. Right? So, so to recap, we have national governments that are poorly suited to match global issues with local context, um, and as a result, they've lost the public trust. We have this kind of rise of platforms on the back of mobile devices that are really, really specifically good at matching global co coordination with local adaptation, and that are ownable by anybody that can create a network effect. 
And then we have cities that people both trust and that can create the network effect. So what I'm proposing, what the, the pitch is for the actual mechanism of how we do this is that cities begin to own the platforms that they create. And this can happen through cities creating teams that do it. More likely, there could be private public partnerships where cities work with technology companies, with telecoms, with really specific goals and social contracts and, and terms to create sustainable services. Because if it's not sustainable, then it's not going to work in the long term anyway, right? So take your favorite uh, uh, like rideshare app or your favorite matching platform and imagine it as a public uh, service provided by the city. Now, all of a sudden, all of the, the worker contracts um, are negotiated at the city level. They become a matter of local uh, of democratic deliberation. So how drivers are hired, how they're paid, what the relationships of gig workers, that becomes a matter of city politics, as does the benefits that those precarious workers receive. At the same time, um, if the cities create these services, then you know most. Once you set up a, a network like Uber, it's not insanely expensive to run it. You basically set it up; it runs as software on phones. It's very low infrastructure. There's huge margins uh, off of these services. So rather than those margins getting sort of sucked up into some random Silicon Valley unicorn, uh, instead now they become a part of the public coffer, right? So they become kind of like a lottery scheme, where instead of that money disappearing, now you can say because we have this rideshare, now we can fund. You know the, the the social good of your choice: public education, uh, child care, elderly care, refugee housing. Right? Suddenly, there's a basis of revenue to provide those local services that hit the most dramatically in that local context. And the reason why I think this is significant is not just to sort of kind of upend Uber, but because over the next 10, 15 years, we're only at the beginning of this sort of Uberization of our economy. There are many low-hanging fruit sectors that are still going to be disrupted where new platforms are going to be created that nobody owns yet. And these platforms are going to be even more tied to our social contract than the existing ones are. And they're going to happen inevitably because platforms are just so much dramatically better of a user experience and so much more efficient to run. So, so every capitalist cynical incentive is going to push us there. Every well-meaning uh, sort of let's make things easier for people incentive is going to push us there. And we're going to start to see platforms around things like distributed urban agriculture, right, which has been talked about here today. We're going to see PTP, or peer to peer power generation. Uh, I'm almost out of time. Okay, I'll wrap it up quick. Um, we're going to see gig work job matching and upskilling, right? Connecting people tasks to jobs like we see with Upwork. We're going to see community health. We're going to see all of these platforms be created and they could either become apps or they could become a part of a stack of city services. And over time, what this would do is this would naturally put more power into the hands of cities without having to have a major power struggle to get there. These are low regulation uh, uh, in areas of investigation, right? There's not a lot of existing laws determining who builds these. And naturally, as power moves more toward, towards these platforms, whoever owns these platforms is going to get that power. So to devolve national power back to the cities, we just need the cities to have the things that are generating that power. Um, we're going to see platforms look more like infrastructure, right? Which we, we've already seen Uber competing for local public transit contracts across the US, right? So already Uber wants to be public transit. That makes a lot more sense if it's owned by the city. Uh, we've seen Airbnb uh, replacing people during natural disasters. In countries like Nigeria, they already use platforms for health regulations that don't uh, exist already. They're embedded into products and you scratch off a code to determine whether your medicine is working. Um, so if we start to do this, the, the third part very quickly, and we can talk about this more after, is that you start to build a layer of technologies, of platforms, of APIs that can be networked together across different cities. Not every city is going to be up for the challenge of creating this. But the, the point is that only one needs to do it. One bold city that wants to sort of uh, embark upon civic innovation, if they create a platform that's made of code that can be shared to other cities, which can then become sort of a laboratory for different local adaptations that can coordinate together. So you could use the same ride sharing app across different cities, but the way the workers are hired would change invisibly in the background. Uh, the user experience for people moving between cities would stay the same. And you would create a framework for social innovation that would give you a platform for pilots, for data, for sharing of information very naturally as a part of just that infrastructure. So this is very, it's, it's very easy for this to happen in some ways. It just, we have to get over how radical it sounds. Um, so I'm, I'm running out of time, but 
that, that's the basic pitch for the Internet of Cities. And I would love to talk to anybody that's working in any kind of city government that wants to look at this closer. Because I'm not the only person talking about this. All it takes is a small mental leap. And it's a surprisingly uh, doable path for, for moving forward through the, the problems of the nation state today. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.